This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with, with head men's soccer coach at UCLA, Ryan Jordan. He discusses the challenges when implementing a new philosophy at a new team, the importance of consistency and messages for your players, and some of the values that the programme looks for in its players. I hope you enjoy. So, uh, Ryan, first of all, thank you very much for jumping on and giving me a bit of time of your Tuesday uh, afternoon for you guys. Uh, how are things? Are you all safe and well? Yeah, doing doing fine here. Perfect. So um, just for people that maybe haven't come across you or don't know your background, you just want to talk through what your current role is, where you work out, what that entails, etc. Sure. Currently, I'm the uh, head coach of the men's soccer program at University of California, Los Angeles. Um, I've been here for two years and this is my 25th year in collegiate coaching, um, at the university level. Perfect. So obviously, um, with where you are at the moment, I imagine you've been quite ravaged by COVID, etc. Um, how was that for you trying to integrate yourself and players into a relatively new program whilst obviously the world's on fire a little bit? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, it, it's affected everybody, I think, pr pretty similarly. I think we were fortunate to be, you know, in an environment that we were able to do a good job in, you know, keeping our team not isolated in a bubble, but having players, you know, be responsible. And so we were able to avoid COVID uh, in our team uh, successfully uh, across the, the year from August all the way until uh, until now. I think what would be interesting to discuss with you is kind of how you were able to integrate your philosophy of play during that time, because obviously you would have had um, limited contact with the players and all that type of stuff. But first of all, do you just want to talk through what your actual philosophy of play is? What, how do you want your brand of football to be portrayed and what does that entail kind of from a game to game basis? Sure. Um, well, I mean, for, for me, football's fun when your team has the ball. And, and so... Uh, cer certainly, we want to be able to have players that are comfortable with it, and and certainly, you know, I want to be able to have you know a team that that can prioritize that as a primary function. And, and certainly, if you're going to have a successful team, you've got to be able to operate on both sides of the ball and play in different manners. But if uh, if dominate pos dominating possession is is of the priority, it means that the focus can be, you know, how do we become a team that that has a understanding of how to find solutions to the opponent and, and the different ways that an opponent will try to play in, in order to disrupt uh, your your type of football that you're trying to implement. And in terms of systems of play that go along with that, uh, I've watched a couple of your games, most notably the, the, the Stanford one where it looked like you played a five at the back. Is that normally what you would play or does that vary from fixture to fixture? Yeah, I mean, we've we've played a lot of different ways. It's the first time anybody said they saw us play five at the back. Um, okay. You know, I think we, we we've played with you know with three at the back, and, and obviously at times you're gonna have you're gonna have wing backs in defense that are gonna have to drop off. Um, but I really I felt like that was really more three four three. Um, we've had other times where we've looked a little bit more three four two or three five two, uh, and other times where you know we've been playing with four at the back and different shapes in front of that. So. You know, from a system of play standpoint, I think, you know, from my perspective, you're trying to get your best team on the field. And from year to year, that can look different. And against different opponents, that can look different. And and so trying to get that group on the field that's going to be able to function in a manner that, that can play the way you want, but also have to deal with the opponent at the same time. You know, I, th I think you're you're trying to find that balance all the time as a coach. Okay, so when you came into the role, um, when you moved from the college you're at before, did your philosophy and system of play match up to what was already happening prior to this, or was it a change for the the personnel and the players to adapt to the way that you wanted football to be played? I mean, I think anytime there's a change in coaching staff, you're gonna you're gonna find that there's going to be some differences. Um, you know, certainly. 
you know, I think that our players have had to adapt to some things that I will do differently than a previous coach may have done. Um, focuses on trying to find balls in different zones. I, I think there can be lots of different components to it, but in general, the team has been able to take it on um, in a manner and attitude that uh, that I'm pleased about because they were willing to work to try to try to see the picture that I was painting and and try to have application to it. And in terms of, I guess, style of player, because if, if you look at it from an English Premier League point of view, trying to get Burnley to play out from the back consistently like Man City do may be quite challenging. Um, whereas, obviously, if you've got players that play similar to that for another team, it would be a bit easier. Was, was the style of football that was played previously easily transferable to use your systems and your philosophy? Did the personnel fit for you to be able to do that? Yeah, primarily. Yeah, I think so. Perfect. So when you were first looking, well, obviously been approached for the role and you accepted, what steps did you take to try and drip feed in what, what beliefs you had around football and what how you wanted football to be played? How did you get that across to the players? Uh, I, th I think with players, it's it's fairly straightforward. You just, it requires a consistency all the time. Um, if, they, if players can expect a consistency from a coaching staff, then there's an ability for them to, you know, know what they're getting on a daily basis. If there's not a lot of highs and lows, but if there's a, if there's a consistent message, there's a consistent demeanor, then I think learning process can take place very effectively. And that's what we've tried to try to come across with. So what, your first kind of week of preseason or, or whatever, what did that entail? What type of sessions were you putting in place? What fundamentals were you looking to get across to the group? Well, our preseason, you know, at the university level in America is so short that, you know, you've got to try to put so many tactical topics in in a short period of time so that your team is prepared to start playing matches against opponents almost after a week. And so, you know, in some ways you're, you're touching topics almost in every facet of the game. And, and, and certainly that's, uh, that's a big challenge. And, and the physical loading component on top of it makes for a pretty – um, quick adaptation for players as they're trying to come into the program or for the returning players, you know, the layering on process hopefully is allowing for them to, to give uh, some, some cultural reference to, to the new players in the, in, the, in those times. So it's kind of for you, for you during that period, you're having to touch on all facets of the game to make sure you're ready for the following Saturday or Sunday, whatever that looks Correct. like. Yeah. Okay. So, what do you prioritize on, on the Monday, if that's when you're starting? What would your first session look like or what did it look like at, during this time? I mean, look, I've done it differently in lots of different years. Um, so, some years you feel like, you know, we need to focus on defending as a, as a priority for the first few days. Other, other times it's been, you know, is it really looking at, you know, we're going to look at attacking topics because we feel like this is an area that we've got to either get better at or we get a chance to really try to get ahead of, you know, the opponents early in a season's organization. Um, I, you know, I think there can be lots of ways to go about it. I've done both. And, and so I think it, it takes looking at your team, how experienced are they, how comfortable are they, how many new players do you have, do you have to educate about certain things. Um, I think all those things have to factor in. Okay, so... From you, from a from a weekly basis, what was your schedule look like? What what do you do with the players? How much uh, contact time do you get on the pitches? What do you do off field? What do you do in terms of gym sessions? What does that look like from a week to week basis? Sure, um, I think I think one of the criticisms of of the way that um, you know the season set up here is that oftentimes you'll end up playing twice in a week, and what that means is that. You've got, you've got a lot of pre-games and recovery days and not a lot of, you know, proper training sessions. And so, you know, certainly we, we are required to have one day off a week, which is an, an NCAA, our governing body, that there that's a mandate. And that's for, you know, student athlete welfare. Um, and your other six days, if, if you're in normal weeks where you're playing twice, then, you know, with your pre-game days and your recovery days and your, your game days, you end up with, you know, trying to implement tactical topics through the use of video, through on-field teaching sessions, uh, in training. Um, you're still trying to get into the gym. You're still trying to help the guys maintain uh, a strength component that they've developed prior to the season uh, so that you're, you know, progressing your team 
during that period of time, but it's uh, it's busy. I mean, you're you're a couple hours a day uh, at minimum with the players on the field, and then when you layer on the gym and and the and the video, you're you know you're approaching probably two and a half to three hours a day, uh, you know, depending on the particular day. And would you normally do Friday, Sunday, or, or what would that look like in terms of your schedules for games if you are doing twice during a week? Um, is it normally Friday, Sunday? No, I mean, we've typically tried to make sure that both in the conference and outside the conference that we're playing, you know, no, with no sooner than within 72 hours between matches, uh, just because physiologically it, it, it gives them a much better chance of having a, a, a good performance. And so, you know, typically a Thursday, Sunday or something similar would be, would be from my estimation, uh, a much better uh, orientation as opposed to trying to play Friday, Sunday, which for years and years was done, but uh, was a bit tragic on Sundays all the time because physiologically it was just near impossible to play at a high tempo for, for a decent match. So on, on a match day minus two for you guys, um, what type of content are you trying to drip feed in, into the players? Um, obviously, you're preparing for the upcoming game and the upcoming opponent. What type of thing typically are you looking to get into those players at that point? Yeah, well, I mean, match day minus two, you're probably, in based on the schedule I've just presented, in a lot of cases, you're probably still in recovery from your previous match. So you're doing some of that. You're, you're starting to look at tactically, what were the things that we did well? How do we reinforce those? How do we talk about some of the things that we haven't done as well? And then we start to, you know, obviously you have to start to address the opponent and, and start to look at, okay, what are the things that we have to look at specifically for the upcoming, the upcoming fixture? And do you adapt your um, systems of play or philosophy of play from opponent to opponent? Or are you very structured on some of the stuff you want to do and then just adapt to make, make uh, minor tweaks in and around that? Yeah, I mean, I think for, for you know, players that feel like they have a comfort and freedom to express themselves, the, the less tweaking you can do is probably the most beneficial for your players. Okay, so... I guess linking to, to your your upbringing in football, where did that start? How did you get into to football in the first place? Uh, what drew you to the sport, etc.? Uh, look, in, in when I when I was growing up in the eighties, nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties, people were playing multiple sports all the time. I w I was no different, and and probably played regularly you know, I was in three or four different sports. And, and so I think in a lot of ways, there was actually a lot of benefit to that from an, an overall athletic standpoint, uh, from a athletic development standpoint, from a decreasing overuse injury standpoint. Um, and so, you know, playing multiple things, I think was actually quite good for me. Um, the, the football side just ended up being the sport that I connected with the most in my teens and ended up being the sport that I felt like I enjoyed the most and was the one that I continued to play, you know, at university level um, and then, and then progressed into coaching pretty straight away after that. Was there any reason that football was the one that stood out? Was it the one you were best at? Was it the one you had best experience with coaches, et cetera? Was there any particular reason why that stood out to you? I think it was just the one I got the most joy from. Um, I liked some of the other ones. Um, the athletic component of it was, was I think the most interesting and, and certainly the nature of the game had, had the most joy for me compared to some of the other sports. I mean, I played some tennis, but tennis what was a bit too repetitive for me. And I, and I, listen, I've had this discussion with lots of tennis players who, you know, each point has different creation qualities and I get that. And there's lots of different things, but at the base of it, it can be, in my estimation, a little bit more repetitive. Uh, football has a little bit more freedom um, and there's never two circumstances that are the same or at least not very often. And so uh, I think I think all of those things fit together along with uh, capacity and an enjoyment to do the physical work that was involved in it. And is there anything that you, you've taken from your upbringing kind of doing other sports across into football? Because I know football is generally quite insular and we don't like looking outside for inspiration but is there anything you, you've taken kind of from what you did back there into how you you teach and coach the players now uh, you, you know i think 
every experience should have some effect on how you think about a sport in general. And so whether it's, you know, talking to some people or working, you know, I'd reference tennis, you know, constructing points. Well, it's the same as constructing possessions. Uh, it's, I mean, it, totally different at the same time, but the thinking and, and the process and, and the planning, I think all of those things can, can translate and play through. Um, you know, certainly you can look at other sports. I mean, American football, which is completely different, there are some similarities with regards to positional responsibilities in like say defending. Um, you know, for those people who, who listen to this, who have no idea about American football, if you think about the defenders at the deepest zones, I mean, those are a little bit like a, a back four in, in, you know, soccer, you know, proper football. And so, you know, I think you can look at different sports and, and have things translate and, and have things that will have commonality, but also can be important ways to communicate information um, that, that will transcend between different sports. And I think that, that can be really helpful in the teaching model. I think that's a really interesting point around the terminology that can be used. Um, I guess culturally there are, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be things that you can use and still. So I, I look at a simple thing like setting screens at corners. If you want to free up a man to be able to go and attack the ball, etc. cetera, setting screens, that's a well-known terminology in basketball that's easily transferable into a football context. Yep. For sure. I think I see, we see this all the time, try, trying to make an additional connection with players and reference something that maybe paints a picture for them in a slightly different way, but that helps the point get across so that they have the picture in a manner that allows for them to execute better the next time out. No, I think, yeah, that's a really interesting thing, the use of terminology in and around that. Obviously, being at such a, a major school as you as you are, do you get much opportunity to go and um, steal ideas or go and watch at the other sports that you've got there? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's always fun to go watch other, you know, top coaches coach. And I'm, you know, for, fortunate to be at a campus that's got lots of those. And so watching other people's personalities, how they interact with their teams, methodology of, you know, developing training. I think all of these things, and whether you're looking at the same sport or different sports, I think you can pick up lots of different things. And I think in, in every evaluation of watching somebody else run a session, regardless of sport, you get to look at, okay, you get to make some value statements. How are they doing it? How would I do it differently? And in the, in that question, you get to start to evaluate the the criteria for what you stand for and how you could adapt and evolve to be better. And, and I think that process is really beneficial to coaches because it allows for that evaluation to take place and then an advancement in thinking or a deeper, a more deeply ingrained thinking in how you go about coaching. And so I look at that as hugely beneficial and, and deepening the groove of um, the methodology that the way you go about it. And I, I find that to be both stimulating and, and obviously I would expect that everybody would see that that would be beneficial for one's own craft. And is there any particular experience that you've had that's kind of stood out to you or really challenged the way that you deliver or your methodologies or just kind of thought, actually, that's, that's such a simplistic way of doing something, but really, really beneficial for the players? I mean, I don't know that I've got one that stands out. I feel like pretty much any time I go watch somebody else run a session, I pick something up and, I, you know, I see a manner of doing thing, of, of doing something or uh, the idea behind doing something or the methodology of the implementation of how something is done. And in some cases, it's, wow, I don't think I ever thought to do it that way. And I don't know that I would want to do it that way. But in that still, there is a learning process for me. And, and so um, I've seen lots of sessions where I'm like, I picked something up there. It was great there, talking to somebody about it there. I think lots of different things all the way along that help continue to uh, shape one's own methodology and thinking. Um, but I think there's also things on the other side where, like I said, the value statement of, I wouldn't go do it that way, but then you have to justify it and rationalize why you don't. And, and I think that's equally beneficial. 
Yeah, I think it's an interesting one. I remember watching, um, I'm a Miami Dolphins fan for my sins, because they're not great. Um, yeah. But I remember watching Hard Knocks when, when Miami Dolphins were on there with Joe Philbin. And he set up a um, practice uh, offense versus defense. And he basically stood in the middle of the pitch and allowed the teams to go against each other and half the pitch. Half the pit, half the team would go one side. Once they'd finished their rep, he'd turn around and do the same the other end. And I thought that was a really simplistic way of making sure you get more reps, but not being in the way of one another. And if you look sure. at like soccer, for example, for example, if you're doing wave practices or patterns against mannequins, the number of time you have everyone going towards one goal. And then they get in each other's way as they're recycling back out and all that type of stuff. And for me, that was a really good example of stealing something from another sport that actually you go, yeah, that's really simple. Just stand in the middle, allow them going towards both goals. And actually, you don't have that issue anymore. Sure. No, and I've seen it done that way with it going both directions on the same field. I've also seen it where they're going opposite directions and going through each other. And, and in some ways you know, both can be equally effective. The first there's, it's, un, you know, it's unobstructed in a lot of ways. The second, they have to deal with the chaos that's going on around them, but they can still get unobstructive and unopposed sequencing. And so if we're just talking about, you know, patterns to goal. I think there's, it's the interesting thing about our sport is that you can do things in a number of different ways to get results in development and training. Um, and that's a really simple one where, you could have them going opposite ways, but you could also have them going up opposite ways the other direction where they're, they're still growing in it, but dealing with things in a different manner. Yeah, I think the, the use of chaos is really interesting because I've used chaos practices a lot with my, my younger ones. I think it's a really good way to kind of stimulate and over over board the, the mind, etc. Is that something that you use quite a lot in, in your training with the older boys? Well, I think I think it's... <laughs> In a lot of ways, the the general function of rondos is trying to get a high number of repetitions in a small space where there's functional reality and, and there's also, I already mentioned repetition, but there's also an intense pressure that comes with it. And so I think in some ways you get an increased chaos that you don't find in the game in those in those moments where players have to solve the solution that makes it easier when they get into bigger spaces. And so you've mentioned rondos there. Is that something that you use quite regularly? And when would you use that in training? Is that kind of at the start as a warm up, or do you use it more as a, you know, a bulk of your practice and try and adapt it into a, a larger game later on? Yeah, I mean, I think I've used it in 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 all in all phases of the training. I think anytime you're trying to get repeated actions, but you want it to have functional reality, it's it's a great way to go about things and. I don't typically use it as warm up um, per se because I feel like the warm up phase needs repetition of football action, but I don't know that you're looking to have it be opposed in a manner that then puts you know the physicality at risk. And so um, typically it's a it's a it's a second step or a third step in a session where we're, we're starting to get at a tactical topic um, and specifically able to create it as a result. And so when, when you're using these rondos, would you uh, make it relative to pitch geography um, and, and player size, or would you just do it as a kind of lead into that a different type of session? I mean, I think the, the more functionally relevant you can make it, the, the better the picture gets conveyed to the player. So I think these are some of the controllable factors that coaches have and, uh, in a manner to be able to have, do the best job teaching. So I think cer certainly that's something that we try to – I think most coaches should try to, you know, pay attention to. And when you're looking at the repetition for players and allowing them exposure to actions they're going to be doing on a game day uh, regularly, um, how do you incorporate that into their training? And do you have individual development plans for players to work on these areas? And if you do, what do they look like? Well, I think it's always important for players to understand the the technical and tactical areas that they've got to continue to grow in. And so if they know the areas of focus, they're able to, you know, spend extra time working on those. Um, and certainly, you know, I think good coaching is creating opportunity for those to be repeated and, and create opportunity for those to be 
completed and managed and monitored so feedback can be given. Um, but at the same time, it's it's creating both the unopposed and opposed opportunities for technique to, you know, to, to be exhibited so that development can occur. And, and I think then the question becomes, you know, how is the integration of that then done within a session? I think that's up for the coach to be able to describe, you know, what is the session objective and, and how do these things fit together? And, you know, what day is it in the week in a, in a season that, that these can make the most sense? And, and how do we prime the team for performance on the weekend? And do, do you formalize these with your players? So would you formalize what areas of development or areas of strength that they've got? Well, I think that's an important aspect because if you, if you don't formalize them, I think they, you don't want to leave things up to the, to the guessing of players um, because they, they need clear feedback. You're not strong enough in hitting these types of service for, for as an example. You know, okay, great. How are we going about it? Let's let's talk about specifics and then let's give you the opportunity to either have the time or have the supervision to be able to start to craft the actions that we're looking for repeatedly that are going to help make the individual more successful and as a byproduct, the team more successful. Okay, so say, for example, you've got a, a wide player. So you're playing three, four, three, as you mentioned earlier, maybe one of your wide players physically very good able to get up and down but at the moment their quality in the final third isn't great in terms of crossing either selection or actual technique for that how would you support them in trying to make gains in that area to obviously get an individual better outcome but also hopefully provide a better team performance and better outcome for your, for your strikers and attacking players etc well, I think, you know, certainly individual work where there's a real focus just on the individual and, and trying to make sure that they understand both what you're looking for and understand the techniques that are required. I think that's going to be hugely helpful and impactful for the player individually. I think secondarily, then, then that has to then be translated to, you know, functional applications in play where they're not doing it just in a vacuum, uh, but they're doing it with lots of moving parts around them. So they now have to start to succeed and make decisions about what they're doing um, at a speed that replicates the game. And so I think what, when you can partner those two things, then you can see some effective growth. Um, and if players can see effective growth, there's a satisfaction that comes along with it, which means that there's success as, as an outcome. And how um, often are, are your players given the opportunity to go and work on that in an individual basis? So if that was an area that's been highlighted, how much room's created to allow them to go away and improve on that area either before or after training? Well, I think this is where you recruit self-driven players, um, guys who want to show up early, uh, get themselves warm, be prepared to do some of that work or seeking out the additional time um, or, or figuring out a time, you know, in conjunction with the coaching staff to get additional work post-training. Um, because I think most coaches would be certainly wanting to make themselves available to, you know, support self-driven players who want to get better in areas. Uh, it's a whole lot easier than trying to convince somebody that they need to get better and, and trying to lead the proverbial horse to water um, so that they can drink it. But it's, to me, you, you've got to find the balance. You also don't want players, especially with how compacted our season is, to be putting themselves in a way of having significant overuse injuries because they went and hit 500 crosses. And so do you see big jumps kind of in the off season? So now that your season's finished, et cetera, and players are aware of these areas of development, do you see a big jump now where they're getting a lot of, of exposure to these types of sessions so that when next year comes, they're in a much better position, a much better place? I think it's it's one of the benefits we have in the offseason is that there is a lot of time for individual development um, and, and collective development. But it's it's in a normal year, we have a lot more time to be able to help with that. And it doesn't mean we're not playing matches during, this, during the offseason because we're allowed a number of them. Um, but we have a greater period of time because we don't have regularly, we don't have matches as regularly. It means that there's more time to have regular trainings, which allow for more, you know, singular player development all, along with group development. And how do you manage that individual need within a team concept? Because like we said there, if you're, you know, if, if you're preparing for a game at match day minus two, although you want to, obviously support that player in their individual tasks. You're also conscious that you've got 
San Diego State in two days, for example. So how do you manage those two and align those two areas? Yeah, well, I think that's managing loading and and just looking at players and and how much work they've done. It's trying to pay attention to okay, how much more how much more work can this player do? You know, how much emphasis do we need on the, the particular topic at this point? How much gain can be? It's risk and reward. How how much gain can be gained versus, you know, if if you've got a guy who's playing ninety minutes regularly, really wants to work on his crossing, and you know he's going to be in a fatigue state, probably him not hitting a lot of crosses, is is a prudent idea, even though he might get incrementally better. Is there a risk of groin injury or something else that's going to now take him out of your first 11? I think these are things coaches have to balance all the time. I think one one point that a coach has made to me previously, which is a really interesting one around the repetition side, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on it, is that if you give a per individual lots of opportunities to repeat it, it might not be game realistic. So the example he used was as a striker, if you give them 25, 30 opportunities of shooting in a game, they'd only maybe get five or six. So actually, is it realistic? What would your thoughts around that be in, in your experiences of player development? Well, like I said earlier, it's, you know, can, can, you, can you focus on making sure that the technique is right? Um, you know, in, in unopposed situations. And then once the technique, you feel like you're, you're comfortable with those actions. And, and like at our level, most of the time we get guys with pretty good technique. And, and so it then becomes, can you put them in environments where them executing now has game related replication? And, and so, yeah, they may only get a handful of chances in a match. Can they be clinical enough to take them? So, can you help them with the, the technical application so they understand what they're going to be required to do in a particular moment? And, and that may be more tactical than technical, uh, but then also on the, on the heels of it, can you then put them under the pressure where they have to then execute it like it will be in a match? And I think if they can do those two things, then you're on your road with uh, player development. And then obviously we mentioned the formalized nature. Is it that just the conversation between you and the player or is that in a written process or, you know, what, what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, it's typically conversational um, because those conversations are constantly ongoing, um, you know, after a season, before a season, in the off season, in, inside of individual training sessions. Um, I mean, that's the coaching part. It's communication and it's, it's guiding players to outcomes so that they, they can have proper development. And so if you've got coaching staffs that that are constantly seeking to provide quality feedback, uh, to give the player an accurate reflection of what what is transpiring and how they can make improvements to the quality in it, then you've got a coaching staff that is uh, focusing on player development, and and that should be in a lot of ways our number one job. And in terms of you with your staff, how many members of staff do you have around the program? And during a, an average training session, how would you divide your roles to obviously cater for everyone during during uh, that session? Sure. Well, the, the, the NCAA, our governing body, has limits on the number of coaches who are allowed to be coaching. Um, and so, you know, I've got three assistant coaches that work for us. One of them is a volunteer. Um, and But, you know, my job is in overseeing is just making sure we're all on the same page with regards to what's transpiring in a session, what are the areas of focus, who's running particular areas, what are their what is everybody's responsibility in a particular phase or segment of the session so that we can maximize the amount of time that we spend with the players. Because having three-hour sessions doesn't make a lot of sense. That's a long time, and it's unrealistic based on the nature of the game and the duration of a normal game. Um, we've got players who are trying to combine being students and athletes, and we're asking them to, and I think most schools are asking those students to be very excellent in both areas. And so, you know, maximizing the opportunity, being efficient in coaching, uh, being able to have a coaching staff that is on the same page with regards to, you know, how a session is going to run, the tactical application of the session, the types of information and points of emphasis that are going to occur. I think these are all the things that the planning phase is important for in going prior to going out to training. Uh, and 
do you, would you guys have it where like one of you would be in possession, one would be out of possession? Would you work for specific units or would you focus on individuals? How would that dividing of work during a session normally look? What process would you go through to decide what everyone's doing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's all of the above. I think, you know, you can always work both sides of the ball with your staff. I think that that maximizes information. You can certainly, you know, pay particular attention and have somebody paying attention to specific players in specific zones of the field or areas of the field or positions in the field. Um, and then, you know, certainly like with something like goalkeepers, you're going to be more position specific and, and try to make sure that you're giving information to a group of players that, uh, you know, function differently than maybe the outfield players do. And so I think it's, again, I think it's planning. I think it's, it's discussing what, what, what we're trying to achieve in the session. And um, I think when it comes off, you get, you get growth and development. I think it's good for everybody on the staff because everybody feels like they've got involvement as well. And so obviously you've got a certain number of uh, quota in terms of coaching staff. Are you allowed support staff and then around that, such as like performance analysis, psychologists, et cetera, or is that within that quota as well? No, the, you, you can, you can have those um, on top of it. Um, and, and certainly I think a lot of programs have the ability to have, you know, per performance coaches, you know, strength and conditioning guys who are in and around it, um, whether it's just on field work or working with data or in the weight room. But I think in, in all of those cases, if somebody's going to be involved, it's important that they are able to see training and are able to diag you know, diagnose and assess, you know, what are the strengths and weaknesses of individual players? And, and because again, everything is about, can we enhance player capability and so a sports psychologist would need to watch training to be able to have a sense of it. Um, the strength and conditioning guy would need to be able to look at, you know, mechanics and performance mechanically to, to see, okay, what, what, what sorts of enhancements need to be taking place. And so, you know, it's, it's how, how you integrate those people around it and how the dialogue is amongst the staff so that we're looking at everybody as a, a circular whole to be able to achieve player performance. So with, within that, obviously, um that's going to take a lot of planning do you have the season um scheduled out ahead of time um so do you have like a curriculum that you have to work off or anything like that i i mean certainly we you know we've got some we've got a base periodization model that that you're going to look at tactically and and physically and, and try to put the players in a situation where optimal performance can occur um but those have to be flexible and adaptable because they're going to change from week to week. If you've only playing one match in a week, it changes the week of training. Um, if, if you're playing twice, it's different. If you're running into an area of the season where you're not strong in a certain phase of the game, you may have to spend more time focusing on that uh, versus something else. And so I think it's, it's, there has to be a fluidity and adapt, adaptability from a coaching staff perspective, but I think you can also have a model in place to, to work off of so that you keep structural you know, planning in mind. And how do you manage that as a coach? Because I can imagine it must be very challenging. Um, it, it, you have to have that flexibility from week to week. And obviously you... Sorry, I'm trying to figure the way to phrase this best. Obviously, no, you're gonna I have. Think, to, I, I think I know where you're going. Yeah, it just it, obviously you don't want to be changing everything from week to week. So, in terms of how how challenging is it for you as a coach not to react to the game that's just gone, where you might have scored four goals and then you're like, oh, we're the world's best, or if you concede ten goals, then obviously you're going to spend the whole week working on defensive stuff. So, how hard is it for you as a coach to reflect and go? okay, we do need to work on this area, but that cannot be our sole focus because within the periodization model, we still need to work on X, Y, Z. Yeah, I think that's where experience is a, is a positive factor. Um, there's a lot of data points over history to, to rely on and know, okay, the ups and downs of the game shouldn't be massively swinging the emotions with regards to changing you know, thinking and, and prioritization of topics. The other part is make sure you hire good coaches and have good people around you so that the dialogue and discussion allows for, you know, the optimal planning that, that, that puts, you know, the right emphasis on the right topics at the right time. And, and that way one coach isn't, 
you know, solely making decisions, but it, there's a dialogue that, that helps benefit uh, the product. And do you think that dialogue between you and your staff is a really important one for them to be able to say, listen, I don't think we're going the right way with this at the moment because of X, Y, Z? Completely. Why do you one place the, it's, such it's one, it's on one of the It's one of the most important things. Why do you say that? Well, because I think, first of all, you want your entire staff to be on the same page. Secondly, you want your staff to be able to have the freedom to have opinions um, because that's part of the joy of coaching and, and having a growth process of somebody having ideas about things and being able to dialogue about them and, and that stretching the entire coaching staff to grow and, and analyze how are we doing things. And I think the point at which you stop doing those things, you stagnate. And, and that's a place I think most coaches would never want to end up. And obviously, I imagine for you, you know, you've been in the industry for a long period of time, as you alluded to earlier, you would have worked with a lot of different assistant coaches and whatnot. When you're, when people have moved on either to go to new pastures or promotion elsewhere, et cetera, what do you look for when you're recruiting the next group of coaches? Do you look for someone who's, really innovative who's going to come in and challenge your ideas do you look for someone to fill a specific need what does that look like uh, i think it can take lots of different shapes i think bottom line you want to get the right person um you want somebody who's going to be intelligent you want somebody who's going to be um sharp on the game you want somebody who's going to be able to articulate and teach you want somebody who's going to be you know, have a niche that they're going to be really excellent in. And, you know, you're trying to find as many of these characteristics and qualities um, to, to surround yourself with. Um, but at the, at the same time, you know, it's, it's probably impossible to get everything all at once uh, because that's just not the way things work. But if you find the right people who are, who are driven, who have great mindsets, who have great mentalities, who have great personal characteristics and character then you have the best chance of um you know the ability to to get you know all of those things out and have a successful yeah successful partnership and do you look for the team to cover areas so if for example you've got one person who's very good at i know very good at the organizational side but maybe not so great on the the dialogue with players would you look to hire someone else who can counteract that that individual so you've got a well-rounded team to work with yeah i think i think that's always the goal and objective um and hopefully you know the coaches are growing and developing the same way that uh the players are and and growing in the areas that they can strengthen their own coaching quality and and I think that's the objective on the coaching side as well. And that's what experience brings. And is there any particular common thread for the coaches that you've worked with, that worked with that have gone on to do really good things or have progressed in their, their career or personal development? Is there anything that those individuals have had as a common thread that you think, yeah, that's why they've really pushed on and that's why they've really progressed within their field? I mean, certainly being passionate about the game is, is, going to be part of it. Um, but I also think, you know, having a good sense of teaching methodology and how to interact with people is another, um, you know, and a willingness to work hard is probably the third component. And so you put those three things together and, and you start to tick some of the major boxes that allow for success. And then looking at your players, obviously the, a big part of uh, college college football out with you guys is the recruitment process. It's a very, um, you know, very competitive uh, sport in terms of trying to get players through the door and trying to get right individuals through the door. In terms of what you're looking for for players to come into your program, what are some of the must-have values that you think the players coming into your program need in order to progress themselves and to progress as part of the team? Now, this is, this is one of these NCAA rules moments where I can't talk specifically about UCLA and what we're looking for, but I can talk in some general terms. Um, okay. and, and, and you'll notice some of the things I've answered are pretty generalistic or philosophical as opposed to 
specifically what UCLA looks for. And that's just, that's an NCAA rule on my inability to talk about this is what we're doing because this can't be construed as a recruiting presentation in any shape or form. I think, you know, obviously most coaches are looking for top athletes. Most coaches are looking for, you know, players with great technique. Um, and, and this is going to end up being pretty generic, but also, you know, I think when you look at, you know, strengths that, that players will have in the game, if it's physical, if it's mental, if it's technical, if it's tactical, obviously everybody would love to have a player who's great in all four areas. Um, but, but certain coaches are going to prioritize based on how they play different aspects of the game. Some coaches, it may be, they put the psychological component of being willing to run through walls and exceed their own physical limits as, as a number one priority. Other coaches may say, um, I'm looking for somebody who just, um, you know, tactically in their thinking of football is just miles ahead of, of the players at their same age around them. Um, and, and obviously the easiest one to assess is, you know, how athletic somebody is and how does that, how is that translating? Because, you know, fast shows up or, you know, hugely athletic shows up pretty obviously uh, in most cases. And so I think, you know, coaches will say, Hey, look, we're looking for all these things. And, um, you know, they're all true. I think the, the, d the deeper challenge for coaches is trying to figure out the, the interpersonal characteristics and qualities of a, you know, a 17 year old or an 18 year old who's looking to go to, to play at the university level and finding out, you know, how is this individual going to be, you know, as they interact with other players in our team, other student athletes on campus, faculty members on campus. I mean, finding the, the characteristic component inside of the player um, is one of the biggest challenges all, along the way. But uh, all of that's part of what makes up recruiting. And I guess, I guess the challenge for you <clears throat> is incorporating all of those factors as well as having your own team values that you're wanting people to fit into, whatever they may be. Sure. Um, and how much of an emphasis every day do you place on those team values? And if you're allowed to, what are they? What are some of the main ones for you guys that you want to kind of live by? Yeah, I mean, look, if, if, you, if you're doing a good job – Nobody wants bad press. So you're, lo you're looking for, you're looking for uh, people with good character who, who are going to focus and prioritize professionally on the two things they're at university level to do. And, and the, the those two main priorities are handle their academics and that pursuit successfully um, and take advantage of the opportunity to be getting a collegiate education. And then secondly, you're looking for you know, guys who want to try to become the best players that they can. And everybody starts at different places with regards to, you know, the gifts and qualities that they have as they enter university level football. But, you know, bottom line, you know, the guys who are willing to do, to work and focus on trying to maximize each area inside of it to go with the academic side, then you're getting the right type of people. Um, and, and guys who are focused on those things. Uh, I think most coaches would tell you they, they get in trouble when they've got guys who aren't focused as primaries on those two things, maybe too focused on the social side of things, maybe, you know, not focused enough on the academic side of things. And, and so, you know, that's part of the relationship building process in, in recruitment is trying to get to the bottom of where does a particular 17, 18 year old kid, you know, talk about, you know, what his goals and aims are and, you know, getting, getting a sense of both interacting with them and watching them and, and seeing if you can get to a place where you feel like this would be a great fit for the program and culture that you're trying to create. And how important do you think those cultural architects are to have within a group? Because obviously there's only so much work you can do your end. You're going to need some leadership from those within the team. So how important do you think having those leaders, um, kind of seniors, et cetera, that can really facilitate the right values that you want from, from your football team? Well, I think it's massively important. It's good teams aren't coach driven. Good teams are internally driven by player accountability uh, and, and a functioning cohesiveness that's inside of a team that players understand how to, 
control boundaries, um, but provide a freedom to interact in, inside of it that, that lets players express themselves. Ho hopefully coaches can give good frameworks to those things. But when it's all said and done, you know, you want good people inside of it that are willing to interact with their teammates and, and also have enough character to step up and tell a teammate that, you know, they're not behaving in a manner that's successful. And I think when you get those types of things in place, then it, it eliminates a lot of extraneous uh, hiccups, hurdles, pitfalls. And you start to get to a place where you have the right people willing to focus on the things that I mentioned earlier um, because they understand that they're in it together, willing to hold each other accountable. And that just takes good character. And for, for you coming into this role, obviously you, you'd be dealing with, um, you know, seniors, et cetera, that have been with the previous previous coach and probably been with him for three years. It's just a substantial period of time. How do you get the buy-in from those older ones that ultimately probably are going to be your cultural architects and you coming in as a fresh voice with new ideas to say, listen, I want you guys on board. This is what we're trying to achieve. I want you to be part of it. How do you get them on board to kind of then facilitate that with the rest of the group? Well, I think if, if players understand what the roadmap to having both individual development and collective success looks like, and that can be articulated to them and they understand that, that the coaching staff's sole purpose is to try to facilitate that, then I actually don't think it's that complicated. Um, I think the buy-in is pretty easy if they understand that there's an investment to make them the best person and player that they can be, and then collectively try to help the group be on track for having the greatest amount of on-field success uh, as a team, I don't think the buy-in part is overly challenging. And so do, do you, does it change at all with the background of the individual? So I, look, I looked through your roster earlier and you've obviously got a, a wide range of nationalities and different areas of, of the US, et cetera. Does the way you have to interact with those players and the expectations of those players change from region to region? Um, the way you have to deal with them, does that change because of the culture that they've come from at all? Um, I mean, I've worked with guys from a bunch of areas of the world and and pretty much every corner of our country, which is not a small country. And I would say that... It has a whole lot less to do with where they're from than who they are. Why'd you say that? Well, I, I think if you've got good people, it doesn't matter where they're from. Um, and, and certainly you may have to explain things in a certain way to get a point across to somebody from a different region. Uh, but if you've got good people, they take information, implement it, and want to operate in a manner that is not just self-centric, but can be group-centric positively. One thing you've mentioned kind of two or three times during this conversation is around the players being good problem solvers um, and having an ability kind of during fixtures to adapt to what the other team are doing, etc. Is that something within your training you place quite an emphasis on? Well, I think part of that is planning um, so the players feel like they've seen things and have an idea about what to expect and, and therefore aren't caught off guard and surprised by what they're seeing in a match. But I think secondarily, it's trying to create environments where players can assess what's going on in a match and can look at, okay, where's the opponent having success or where, what are they trying to, you know, enforce against us? And, and, and as a result, find the solutions, um, you know, for those potential problems. And, I think if you're doing a good job coaching, your players are able to assess the opponent. If you're doing a good job coaching, your players are able to understand what's coming against them and how to counteract it. And, and if those two things have a good balance, then you probably have set your team up to have, you know, the, the ability to deal with, you know, opponents and, and try to implement what they, what we are, or they, you know, their, our team is trying to do uh, to have success. And within practice situation, how do you give them exposure to that? Because I, I can't imagine it's going to be one of those things where, you know, you're playing on a game on a Saturday and all of a sudden you just go, okay, well, what problem they're solving? There's going to need to be some steps before that. So how do you facilitate that in practices before 
to get them to the stage where they can be analytical during the heat of, of battle, if you like? Sure. Well, I think, I think, you know, painting the picture via, I mean, you've got learners that pick things up in different ways. So painting the picture via video, I think is helpful for others. That, yeah, and I think these are all components walking through things physically so, so that they understand what, what to expect. And then, you know, creating exercises that are going to, you know, directly show, you know, what the opponent may prospectively be looking to do. And I think when you can start to blend those things together, now your players start to feel like, yeah, I'm pretty comfortable with what we're walking into and expecting to see. And then it becomes more about execution and implementation and, and just assessment as opposed to them having to cope with things that they weren't expecting. And for you and your staff, how often and how much time do you spend analyzing and assessing opponents um, that are coming up to have an idea of how you're going to set your team up and prepare them for the upcoming fixtures? Well, I mean, certainly we do it for every game. Um, I don't, I don't think it requires hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of preparation. I think in a lot of ways you can, you can watch a little bit of a couple matches most recently played and, and get a pretty good sense of what the opponent is trying to do. Um, because I don't think most teams change too much from game to game. I, I think it's too challenging to do that, especially with the compactness of our schedule. And would you look at um, trying to deny specific individuals? I look at uh, the CV coaches website, which is really good. It kind of did a, a masterclass of Jose Mourinho and he spent the entirety of that, webinar talking about how we stopped Lionel Messi in the Champions League final now I appreciate you obviously you're not playing any Lionel Messi's but in terms of with your roles will you have an emphasis on a player and how to stop that player if there is an, a standout in one of the opposing teams well I think it's certainly making your players aware of look this you have to pay attention to this player this player these are the characteristics these are the things they typically do with repetition you're trying to disrupt those those moments um, and make make the opposing player have to do something that they maybe are less comfortable doing. I think that's that's normal coaching. Uh, I, I would assume that Mourinho talked about how he got numbers around Messi, forced Messi out of zones that he wanted to pick the ball up in and, and was able to therefore ha ask him to play from different areas of the field that he wasn't as accustomed to or not as accustomed to, but wasn't going to be able to directly impact goal scoring in the same way. And so you know, I think every coach will will try to see, you know, who are the players that we have to really be concerned about and how do we try to disrupt normal service and flow through through and to those players and out of those players. And are you able to get uh, analytics on people's games? Are you able to get data for, for your guys so you can say, actually, yeah, listen, their right winger actually he dribbles double the amount of anyone else in the team. So we know on that side, he's going to be a dribbler that we're going to have to be aware of. Do you have access to that? Yeah, we can get that data. Um, but I think it's just easier to show your players on a couple of occasions. Just look, this is the type of dribbling actions. Great. So your left back now knows that the guy playing against him is trying to take him down the line every time. Eh, that helps him. Get onto the field, talk about where that ball is being picked up and what type of actions are typically coming. Is it in combination? Is it in dribble? Uh, again, these go back to just painting the pictures so that the players know what they're walking into and have a sense of it, you know, on game day. And in terms of for you working with these individuals, um, is there anything with the ones that have gone on to progress um, either kind of w within your program or go on and, and do better things in terms of MLS and all that type of stuff? Is there any common threads with, between those players as to why they were able to make that jump and why they were, have been successful moving forward? Well, I think there, there's certainly going to be just a, a physical component. Like they have, to, they have to athletically meet a standard that's going to allow them to succeed at, at a, a level that's more athletic than, than the university level. That's going to be, you know, one of the foundational components. Um, but I think, you know, going beyond that is, you know, players that can accept and meet the demands of the game and can can succeed in in arriving, um, you know, at 
you know, encountering what the demand is and, and being able to overcome the demand uh, successfully repeatedly. And I think that's what makes great players. And obviously players that have good technique and, and you talk about technique, typically people think with the ball, but that could be individual defending technique. And so you start to mix a couple of these things together. Um, now you start to, you know, paint the picture of somebody who can play prospectively at the next level. And then, you know, the intangible component is just the individual drive and, and determination to succeed and win all the time. I, I don't think there's too many pro players that aren't that interested or, or don't have that component to it. So it's, it's really a blending and mixture of, of all of those things. So listen, Ryan, uh, last question for me, which is, Who's the best player or coach you've worked with or against and why? I didn't freeze. I'm just thinking. No, um, fine. I always like seeing the, seeing the cogs turning for people. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I, I feel like I've worked against a lot of guys coaching wise who are very, very good. And, and you know, from a, from a coaching standpoint, you know, coaching is about, there's lots of different ways to play and lots of different ways to win games. And coaching is, about the ability to get the entire team 100% bought into the methodology of the way you're going to play and, and then able to execute it. And, you know, I think that's what the best coaches are able to do. Um, and, and so I, I've seen lots of guys be effective in doing that at a really high level. Um, from an individual player standpoint, geez, um, you know, Again, it's I, I've seen I've seen center backs that are almost unpressable. I've seen you know strikers who are incredibly challenging to get a hold of for defenses. But I, so I don't I, I feel like I'm jumping your 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 question. But I just feel like I I don't know that I can point a finger at one player in particular because I think the center back who can't be pressed and can find passes that break the line vertically when the opponent tries to apply additional pressure to contain them is, is equally or more valuable than, you know, the most special central midfielder that finds the right pass that breaks lines all the times or the striker that can find the back of the net. And so I know it sounds like I'm, I'm dodging the question, but I don't know that I have a great answer for you because I've seen so many over the course of the last decades that I, I don't have one guy that I thought, oh, he's the best or one coach that I thought, oh, he's the best. No, it's fine. To be honest with you, I'm more interested in the answer as to why. And I think you've explained really well there as to why you place emphasis on those players or why the coaches stand out in the way that they do. So that's absolutely fine. But listen, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for going through your workings and uh, I'll catch up with you again soon. Okay. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.